If God is like a potter, well, what are potters like? The scientists love to decorate. You can worship God however you want to, and you can use your body. Sometimes art is supposed to point to a better reality. For me as a person of color, as a woman of color, I think that it's one thing important to be authentic. Maybe the, the word is different, but the visual can, can do more. From the simpleness out of the sermon, um, I just try to recreate it. It was such a worshipful moment for me when they started blowing their bubbles. So I think often about what art brings to the worship space. And I think back over our history, we've been so focused on the auditory part of worship. You listen to the preacher, the sermon is the central part of a worship service. But we, especially as Mennonites, are discovering the, the power of bringing our attention alongside the presence of God by using our bodies and by using our eyes, our hands, and the worship can be, um, the worship can blossom by use of more of our senses. And I think that's what art is bringing to us. We are all different. So when I teach, I have students who are visual learners and students who are audio learners. And um, so, so some, some look best, work best, learn best by reading the text. Some learn best by hearing me. Some learn best by seeing things. And I think the same is true in worship. So we do ourselves a great disservice if we only craft a worship experience that draws on one sense or that works best for one kind of learner or worshiper. We need to speak to as many different um, types of learners and to use as many different senses as we can so that we increase the amount of people we're, we're drawing into the experience. Well, pers personally, I, I appreciate beauty. I think ugliness is almost a sin. Um, and especially when it's in, <laughs> When it's in, I mean, nothing is really, people can make ugly things better than God can. <laughs> uh, everything is beautiful in, in a sense, but, but where we neglect to pay attention of beauty uh, and just look at everything as utilitarian in life, people, chairs, whatever, I think it, we, we miss some of the, of the richness of the way we're created. And so worship itself, I think, has a, create, a beautiful creative side to it if it's genuine. Something that I think um, is still important to us is creating that visual element. And for me, something that the visual does um, in a different way that the music or that the spoken word offers is to, to really create that space. And to me, it sets the environment for us to be in and dwell in. And sometimes we use artwork as, as a centerpiece and we focus on it and we discuss it, but most of the time it is simply there. And um, what I have been amazed by is that even though it might not be referred to, it might not be spoken to during the course of a service, it's still very present. And that probably more than the spoken words that I might share in a worship service, I get more responses to the artwork or the, the ways that the visuals are, are shaped for that Sunday. For the more artistic people in the church, um, that's a, I think it's a growing edge for us to be able to um, figure out ways that they can use their artistic expressions in our worship service. And that's something that we want to become more intentional about. When we got together and we talked about things that were important for our worship service, being intentional was one of them and involving 
more people from the, from the congregation. Um, I decorate the sanctuary. So a minute of the visuals comes through prayer of me coming in and doing the decoration and praying to see where God leads me to um, put the visuals in. Um, I usually pull the decorations out from like either holidays, sermon sessions. So like in January, we have a session where we just relax. We don't have too many um, programs going on. It's like we're on sabbatical. So that's like after Christmas, take a rest period. Mm. So I like to decorate the church in like a white, calming mm. color to, to um, so it can be like calming coming in on Sunday mornings. Um, so for me, visually, it's the decorations because I just love to decorate. And coming in and seeing people's faces when they see the decorations, giving, oh, when you do a good job, but it's just seeing their faces light up when they come in and see the decorations. When we started our congregation, we started a group called Art Spirit. The idea was to cultivate within each of us our art spirit and to imagine what that's like if indeed we have that image of the Creator within. What does that mean? And that's when we realized our congregation is full of artists. I think Chad and I counted up 35 at one point. And we said, okay, let's give each of those artists two months to exhibit their work here in this public space that we already have for coffee time. If we're in a congregation kind of overflowing with artistic expression and ability and interest, what are the what are the many ways we can kind of bring that to the forefront in the building? So that was an, an important piece to me. And I think the gallery really kind of grew out of those sensibilities. We have so often relegated this to something that like either a certain group of artistic people in the congregation do or that we hire professionals who somehow we think have magical artistic gifts to do. And for me, finding ways to create art with folks who don't think of themselves as artistic people was incredibly meaningful and powerful. And I think for them was too. It's not about professional skill, it's about expression. And, and I'm an example of that, you know, I. I got to do a show and I'm a very amateur artist who just got taken up with collage in a way that it's been a really important thing to me and I love it and um, and I but I don't think I'm somebody who would ever have thought well I should do a gallery of what I'm doing a gallery show that just wouldn't have been in my yeah I don't know but this place is a place that helps people claim the artist within them, I think. Sometimes you can discover something when you're trying out a new thing. And for some people, art is that, but I think they can come across things that you never would have provoked in a sermon. <laughs> there are metaphors in the, in the scriptures of God being like a potter. Well, what does that mean? That, that, that actually means this like very tactile thing. There are things as a, as a potter that your hands know that that isn't like a direct line between like your hands and your brain. It's like this knowledge that resides in your hands. And the only way to acquire that knowledge is to spend time with the material and interacting with the material. In fact, my, my sensibilities as a potter say, 
we've like misread a lot of these metaphors because we don't pay attention to like, what's the unique kind of knowledge and understanding that, you know, if God is like a potter, well, what are potters like? I think there are quite a few people here who have had traumatic experiences with scripture and how scripture has been used about how religious institutions have wielded their power and influence on people and I feel like I've often experienced that um, that the art in the space whether it's visual or music like people can connect to that more in some ways um, maybe more consistently than the words in the service. We know from the story of David of how he danced before the Lord and we say you know if if David felt like he wanted to dance before God and give that dance to God why not do it now so our children we like to 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 invite them and you know, to, to worship and dance or using flags or using imagery they, they get very excited they love it and and it's very important for us as a church to teach these children that you can worship God however you want to and you can use your body as a form of worship and if you want to, you can jump, you can, you can clap, you can move around, but know that what you're doing is, is, is giving on to God as a worship. God sent his son for us to die, why not celebrate that? And I feel like, at least for me as a worship leader, I'm up there because I can't contain my emotions. When I think about God, I'm like, oh yes, Jesus, <laughs> you know? And I feel like I have to go and like dance and express everything that I, that I have because I am so grateful for, uh, of what he did for me. From an early age, we teach the little kids that don't be shy, you know. Um, God didn't just give us this body just to function in every day, you know, survival. He gave it to us because he wanted us to glorify him, to like express our love to him. And he, if he gave us his body, why not use it for his glory, you know? I just saw a little one. She was just having the time of her life. And for us, that's fine. That is perfect. If you're doing it for God and she wants to copy all the, old, the older girls, for, for us, it's like, you know, she's learning how to worship and not be ashamed of, of you know, of her body and, or how to worship or even, um, you know, be embarrassed, you know. Just know that, that using your arms and your hands and your feet and dancing and clapping and moving and, and this is just a worship, another form of worship to God. So when you think about art, um, some people say art is supposed to reflect uh, reality, and that's not completely true. Uh, sometimes art is supposed to point to a better reality, and most art today attempts to do both. They will say it's reflecting reality, like uh, if I listen to a rap song that's full of um, people getting shot and getting hurt, someone would say that's reflecting reality. Uh, however, um, that's not everyone's reality. And generally, I grew up in that kind of environment, and you've talked to anybody who lives in that environment, and they will tell you that that's not the reality they want to live in. They want to live in a better reality. So the idea of the pastor or the minister is also to promote this better reality through Christ talking about hope. 
for me as a person of color, as a woman of color, I think that it's one thing important to be authentic, to have authentic worship space that is representing the people that are here, to also have people have ownership and voice for uh, people to create, and then for myself to see people that look like me, and to see people that are um, part of the community, part of the vision, part of the mission, that also represent communities, um, communities of color, BIPOC communities. The body of Christ is best represented, I think, with as a body that has different features to it. Um, it isn't monochrome or isn't, isn't alike a either. It, it, the, the human gifting behind the body of Christ is diversity, but so are the people themselves. And, and that reflects you need more than one kind of person to, to, to kind of understand the image of God. So there's this aspect of where, as a passive outreach, I have to be I have to uh, be conscious of my presence and what my presence communicates to people. Now, what that also, what that doesn't mean is that I have a set uniform. I mean, I know pastors usually, males might wear a suit and tie. Next Sunday, I might be in jeans. Uh, you know, and I'm preaching next Sunday, and I want to invite, like, a few youth I know from the neighborhood, so I might end up wearing jeans and a nice shirt, you know. So uh, I'm very aware of how my presence and presentation can impact how people see not only me but to see this church. Uh, I think one of our, our pieces is uh, different colored people, different clothing outfits like in a circle representing kind of unity, representing uh, difference but also representing that we're a global body of Christ um, and so people can visually see that right like at Whitehall we're, we're blessed with having people of different nationalities and ethnicities, different languages, different cultures. Um, and so we can see that as we're worshiping and singing together in our sanctuary, but it's also a visual up front that people can say, oh yes, this is what it means to be the body of Christ globally. Because sometimes uh, English is, is not our uh, uh, mother's, mother's, mother's language, right? So it's not easy to to speak in fluently in English. So with the visual, it help. It help more because it, maybe the the word is different, but the visual can can do more better. Yeah. Yeah, we, we rent this worship space um, from the Lutheran Church here. They have been wonderful in um, helping us with what we all would, that we need to make this space accommodate to our, to our, to our congregation in our church. We um, try to make it uh, look like our place when we come in here. And so we have several banners that we put up um, that kind of express what is important to us. We are a, a bilingual church, English and Spanish, so we sing in both languages and we try to interpret everything. Often I'll try to uh, pick symbols or illustrations or pictures that go along with my message or a point that I'm making. And I try to be conscious of the diversity in our congregation so uh, it reflects the, the people there uh, reflect the people who are in our congregation, but also sometimes symbols will communicate better than words, a particular point that I'm making. Para mí ha sido de gran ayuda eh, poder tener eh, audiovisuales, paneles donde pueda yo leer en, en español, o sea, la traducción de lo que el pastor está compartiendo con nosotros. Eh, eso ha sido de gran ayuda porque generalmente los que venimos a la iglesia, no todos, pero hay un segmento que no sabe eh, bien el idioma. Entonces, este, el, el pastor mm, creo yo que nos ayuda mucho 
poniendo la traducción y también imágenes, imágenes de acuerdo al tema que está compartiendo. All of our congregants, all of the people who attend, are in a sense bilingual, bilingual or language learners. Either they're learning Spanish or they're learning English or reinforcing what they already know in the other language. And I think for, um, for, for people who are learning a second language, visuals are so important and color and and, and things that, that reinforce what they're seeing and hearing help. Um, I think color would be the main way we try to transform this space into a worshipful, um, welcoming space. The colors, we, we do uh, often try to follow the liturgical year. Advent is purple and then, um, uh, Pentecost is red and Easter is white and some of those colors to communicate the season of the year, the Christian year. Um, we have a creative God and we have a God who loves color and creativity and so that's part of what we want to express here in our worship space. do have meaning. The color pink is a color of love and the the color purple it just means royalty and the blue one to us it means the Holy Spirit and the move of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes when we are worshiping and we are listening to a song that is saying um, you know or proclaiming how great is our God and that he is king and he is Lord when we are using those flags and and it has the color is it color purple um, we are just declaring it or claiming it not with our mouths only but we are also um, using it and in as in as in as in, as in a flag this is the way I see it it's like um, when a king would come to his to his to his to his castle or to his place his palace um, you know all these flags would be up they will be welcoming him so when we're using this flag it's like we're we're celebrating our God we're celebrating Jesus we are we are um, singing about his victory we are singing about his the victory at the cross so we are celebrating or inviting with the flag or the, with a blue flag, inviting the move of the Spirit the way He wants to move in our midst. And when we look in the scriptures, uh, you know, Jesus Himself uh, instituted uh, the Lord's Supper as a sign, as a symbol, as a visual, we could say, that we participate in. Baptism is a, a visual, very visual. Uh, representing our, our new birth and our commitment to follow Jesus. In a sense, if you think about it, when Jesus told parables, these were like visual illustrations. And he told them about things that the people cared about. So he talked about relationships, money, work, uh, agriculture. All these things were the things that the people at his time were very important to us. So I really like um, every year we do um, something when we like sign the covenant and it's always a different thing. And we do that instead of traditional membership. So we spend time every year talking about saying yes to Jesus and saying yes to being a part of this particular body of Christ at Whitehall Mennonite Church. And again, we want it to be something that's visual. I remember uh, two years ago, we, we, we came here and then I remember about the uh, two, two covenants that we made, like the first one that we signed the thingy and then the last one because of the COVID. Uh, 
we just uh, write in the boat, say yes, and then take a picture and then send to them. Yeah. One year we did um, like a woven paper and then you signed your name on the strip that you wove through. One year we did fingerprints on a tree. Um, trying to think what else. One year we just signed like a scroll. So in two weeks we will bring in this very large rock and we will have a service where we remember how God has been faithful over the course of the past year. We Every year we do the Ebenezer Stone. So we have this huge rock that lives outside and we bring it in like uh, we have a cart, <laughs> bring it, bring it in and we write on it all of our memories of the past year. Um, good memories, bad memories, whatever. And then at the end, we take it back outside and we put it outside. And then over the year, all of those things get washed and then it's clean for the next year. Yeah, this, uh, this is basic from the Matthew 16, 19 about I will build my church on the rock to the Petra, to the Peter. So that's why we put as the church, we have a covenant because covenant is make it more comfortable for everybody especially for the member, it doesn't matter. So every year we're doing that one just to be remembrance, just like we do the communions, the same thing like the covenant, every year we do something, but with a different way. Sometimes like uh, with the rock, with the handprint, with the sign the cardboard. It's just a way of like looking back over the past year in the church like what who left or who joined or who had any kind of significant things or any any other things sometimes we just write like you know children or something if there was something meaningful um, and then it just kind of helps us to look back every year and then we sing um Come thou fount of every blessing, because it has a verse in it about we raise our Ebenezer. So um, it talks about um, just going going through and remembering. So I really like that we do like a visual every year of that. Hey, well, it started off too. Um, I not understanding like the sermons when they when they speak um, that this thy you know when they would read from the Bible and then the visuals I my granddaughter <clears throat> I wanted her to understand some of these things because they're 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 neat you know and a friend of mine so uh, the visuals uh, it's just something that it, um, even when they do plays or skits we like doing that too and that and the adults a lot of the adults enjoy that too so it's just a simple the simple out of the sermon the simpleness out of the sermon. Um, I just try to recreate it. I also think we have to think generationally. And art is such a great way to involve children. But there's this child in all of us that actually like maybe to play with Play-Doh on occasion or color sometimes. The other fun thing about visuals with children is that often it's not just a visual, it's something kinesthetic. like. I can remember one time we had bubbles and we blew them in church. It was the third Sunday in Advent and it was so surprising for me. I knew I was going to do this with them, but just in it was such a worshipful moment for me when they started blowing their bubbles. It was such an expression of um, the joy of, yeah, the joy of, <laughs> of, of Mary's song and yeah in a new way. <laughs> so today we are talking about Jeremiah at the Potter's house. And so for you kids who are here, um, up here on the table I have clay. So I would invite you to come up. You can sit here around the table. You can make something out of the clay. Um, while I'm preaching. Yeah, we decided several years back that we wanted our children involved in the service. And so we used to have a children's church, like the kids would all leave and they'd do their own thing. 
And that just didn't work for us because our kids were missing seeing things like communion. They didn't get to participate in like a prayer time at the end of the service as a response that, you know, we, we've spent time with God and now it's our responsibility to respond back to God. And so we felt like that was an important piece of their discipleship that was missing. We began creating ways to involve the kids in the service. And during the pandemic, our youth really took it to the next level with um, presenting the children's story. Um, but I'll usually email them at the beginning of the week and say, you know, you're doing the story this week. This is the Bible story that you're presenting. And they take it and go with it. And they've done puppet shows. They've done skits. They've acted out dramas. Um, they've done digital storytelling, made movies, made cartoons, all kinds of things. But then I was also challenged as the, you know, one of the main preachers like, how can the kids be involved during the sermon time? Because that's the most boring time of the service for them. Um, and so today, with, this, the, with the, the focus being the scripture from Jeremiah, um, with Jeremiah at the potter's house, I thought, well, I'll just get some clay and let them sit up here in the front and let them make things out of clay. Um, and they can be, you know, experiencing what Jeremiah was seeing. And who knows what God might speak to them. Now, when I went and asked them, like, did you listen to anything I said? They're like, no, we didn't hear a thing you said. We were busy doing, we were playing with our play. Um, but it was fine because I did, like, there was time that I had to sit there with them and also make some things and just kind of talk to them. Um, and that's important. They need to feel like I'm their pastor as well, no matter how young they are. So I'm aware of, how to interpret visuals when you look at them. I'm, I know how to do what we call a media literacy where we know how to look at images and go beneath the surface and look at the context. I often use that when I'm working with youth because they're in a sea of images all the time through their phones, through their screens, and sometimes with them coming so fast, they don't have time to think about what these images mean. So I help unpack that with them oftentimes where I'll you know, say, what do you see? And they'll say, this is what I see. I'll say, now, what do you see in the background? What is trying to be communicated through this image? I think more um, critically and longer about what images of God and of humanity am I portraying to these children? Because they don't have as long of a, a history with... Um, the images of God. As a teen, I did graffiti, but I didn't do it on walls. I just did it in a book. A lot of us were like that. We just would do it in a book. And um, one of the things that uh, that I appreciated the churches when I was in my 20s and I was very much connected to hip hop culture is that they gave me space to express that from a Christian perspective. So I was able to bring my drawing graffiti skills to bear when I was a youth minister. That kind of, those kind of ideas, kids begin to, teens begin to expand their idea of what's possible visually. And we even went as far as even writing raps and things like that. So it wasn't really just about the visual arts. It was also the performing arts as well. I'm not saying we did all of that well either. <laughs> but my, the main thing that I was more excited about is that it was inspiring something in them. Time and time again. During my time here at Laurel Street in 2006 as a pastoral intern with the Ministry Inquiry Program, I got to be part of the Mosaic Project. And this was a project that was initiated by the Outreach Committee here and was funded through a local grant um, through the city. And so we were able to hire uh, an artist to work with us through the process and to uh, appoint some youth as apprentices in the process as well. Um, and so they got to participate in a paid internship throughout the summer. And so we had daily uh, times that the community could come and that these youth came and worked on this project alongside the artist. And so from design to completion, um, the youth and community were involved in this process. And so it started by envisioning what the peaceable kingdom looks like to us today. 
And so the youth were invited to draw and create um, pieces of what that could be. And so they created animals, some from their imagination, some real to life, um, images of the scene that is their home, um, so urban scene. And that was all compiled into the piece that exists today. And so um, the artist really led us through that process from rolling the clay, stamping, glazing, snipping and um, putting together the mosaic. And that was just a really tremendous experience for me to participate in, to join with the youth in our church and community in completing that, and just to see the way that it was offered, not just to ourselves as a congregation, but offered to the community as an expression of our vision for how we want to live out the kingdom of God here in Lancaster, in Cabbage Hill, and in, in the world. And so I think that to me, says a lot about who we are as Laurel Street. It is a way that we try to take something from within us and share it externally. And um, it also um, speaks to the diversity of our congregation and the way that we come together to create something new and exciting and that is visible to, to the world around us. We have a fairly intergenerational church. There's a lot of families, a lot of young people, and we've tried to create an environment where the youth that are working with the sound team and with the worship team feel comfortable making suggestions. Um, so I think that the kids are also thinking about the visual elements of the sanctuary in ways that we might not even be thinking about it um, based on other experiences they've had or things they've seen in other places. There are those who have great, um, great potential to contribute to the future of the Mennonite church, that if we don't capture them, if we don't, uh, if we, if they are not invited um, not just, again, invited to a seat at the table, but help build the table, right? Um, we, are, we are missing out, you know, on the future, I believe, of building of the kingdom of God. I think art is part of the human experience, and anything that's part of the human experience should be in the church. Um, and I think it's important that it not be excluded because it, including um, art means that you're including more of the diversity of human experience and for some people art is a really important part of who they are and so I think that everyone has a place to um, belong in the church and art is part of that I think. The art piece that came out of me came from a program that we did in the church when I first started and they was telling me how gifted I am in creating and in the art field. And they gave me this job when I started attending the church to decorate. And, you know, the belief they had in me that I did not see in myself was priceless. So when I put my heart in decorating the church, it's from all the belief people have in me to do it when I first started. Set my feet upon the ground, make my footsteps the, the decorations kind of evolved from different people. Jerry Holsoppel had a big hand in, in envisioning and imagining kind of creative, non-traditional, but but very uh, rooted in tradition at the same time. So the, some of the, I think the, the primary visuals are, is, the, is the series of photographs around the edge, which are kind of like icons and have a relationship to the Stations of the Cross. To grow up Mennonite and think you're an artist is one thing. It's very challenging because it doesn't really exist, that conundrum. But if you take that and you say to grow up Mennonite and you're an artist who wants to do works that are about theology and God and faith, 
that's even another notch up there. But I went off and did my AMBS, got my MDiv, uh, was on the pastoral team in some of the largest Mennonite churches, did youth, youth work in big crowds, played guitar, did all the music stuff, all the right stuff, but, it, but Emmanuel's the first place that let me do what I really thought I should do. So for this particular one, I looked at Stations of the Cross, even though I didn't want to do a traditional one. And then, because I had Linford help me choose sort of events, so I would read the passages in, in the New Testament that were dealing with those events and think about them. And then I would think about what might that look like? And, and I wanted really strong faces because I thought that was important for this series. And then I drew a rough, sort of just rough idea of what might be in it, often not real concrete. You know, like the second one, which is Jesus in the wilderness, you know, basically I said, well, what does our wilderness look like? You know, it's, it's Broadway, it's, 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 you know, the whole television advertising electronic and this is before the internet was really big so it, it doesn't make a play in that and so then I just thought of that and so that has probably 35 40 images from New York City in it and then some other things and then the face so that I sort of think about what it is that I'm working with um, the another another big feature is the stained glass window in the front that was uh, that kind of evolved. We had a cross in the uh, in the space, and then again, Jerry um, designed and installed, uh, developed and installed, or he, he uh, created and installed the uh, stained glass window, which is quite amazing. And so I tried to have every panel is supposed to have three colors to sort of represent that Trinitarian idea, and the cross was meant to be. Red, which is passion. If you look really closely, you can sort of see a facial structure within the cross itself. Uh, I broke the glass. This glass you break with a hammer, so it's not cut. It's, so it's also this idea of broke, within brokenness comes out this beauty, this in this shatteredness comes out this beauty. That's what makes the glass so gorgeous is because the shattering leaves facets all over the place. See, because what I want this to happen is that when Missy joins our congregation, which she did a couple years ago, she sees this and says, I can do that too. And she creates seasonal works for us that go right behind the pulpit. I've done like up at the altar. Um, we have like a, um, where we did scarves, attached scarves and draped it. And uh, like at Christmas, um, um, I've always uh, did a pine, pine trees and pine cuttings that I go out and cut myself. A lot of, of the posters, like for the tamale sale, I almost forgot. I do those every year, and uh, like I just got done with the covenant, and yeah, it does make me proud, you know. And I just I want people to like and enjoy the colors and the beauty of. Uh, of the occasion and the art that goes with it, you know. Part of the legacy is not just your work. Part of your legacy is whether you open the space for other people to, to exhibit their artistic works. But, but what I want to keep happening is for people, no matter who comes in this, they still see the visuals as an entry point for their connection with both the congregation and with God. I feel like we are co-creators with God. That it's not that we are a ball of clay that has to be blended and molded to a certain way of doing things, but that God hears us and responds to us. And we hear God and respond to God. And when we enter throughout life, it's that call and response that can build a deeper sense of faith and appreciation for each other because we notice the creativity of God coming through other people in ways that we may not have experienced ourselves. 
anything that's part of the human experience should be in the church. The main thing that I was more excited about is that it was inspiring something in them. And I'm a very amateur artist who just got taken up with collage in a way that it's been a really important thing to me. Um, not just, again, invited to a seat at the table, but help build the table, right? Um, we, are, we are missing out, you know, on the future, I believe, of building of the kingdom of God.